Hello and welcome back to the Poven. This week, Coyote May, Kristen, and I have a really candid conversation about how our practice of magic, and by that I mean doing spells, making talismans, candle magics, and the like of that, how that for us is very therapeutic. It's a healthy coping mechanism that we work with to navigate feelings of anxiety, depression, and stress, and all of the things that life throws at us. I think you'll enjoy this conversation. We really get into those ways that magic soothes, heals, connects, and draws us closer to our desired states of being in this big old complicated world. So get your candle ready and settle in with us for this conversation. Hello and welcome back to Keeping Her Keys podcast. Today, Kristen, Coyote May, and I are going to be following up on our recent conversation about abiding at the crossroads of witchcraft and psychology. We've been talking a lot since we recorded that episode and looking at the comments in different places on that episode. And we're here today to offer some ways to find magic as an antidote to stress, anxiety, depression, kind of whatever is causing you distress, how magic can be a real balm. It can be a form of self-soothing that is very healing. I mean, a lot of times we can get into self-soothing, like numbing and so on, and it's not very healing, and how you can find a lot of joy in magic. So this is where we've landed uh, in the few weeks since we've recorded it. We hope you enjoy our conversation today. Uh, we'll begin as we always do with our opening ritual. So if you have a candle, light your candle and we'll go through the simple ceremony of that counterclockwise motion of cleansing, purifying, banishing, just as you're making that circle, anything that's kind of weighing on you, just see it taking flight as you cast that energy around. And now we're going to protect ourselves, um, focusing on what we find healing, what is good for our mental health, keeping all of that close and connected to us. So I thought for an uh, invocation today, we would use the opening verse from Entering Hecate's Cave. It is to Enodia I cry when I am lost. Shine your torches so that I may return to your sacred road. I am the pilgrim of your truth. Guide me to rebirth so that all that is false is shed. And I am woven whole from the threads of my soul. Hail Enodia. Um, Enodia, of course, is a title of Hecate that's linked to an older goddess that refers to um, you know, an aspect of the sacred feminine that has governance over journeys, roads, crossroads, thresholds, the home, children, women, the marginalized. It's a really complicated figure um, and very much a spirit. I think when we're talking about our wellness and mental health and sp specifically, that Anodia can be a really helpful ally for us as we are going, walking down that journey. 
um, towards our own wholeness. And that's something that we've been talking about preparing for this is like, what is wholeness? So maybe we'll start there with like a big, big picture concept, and then we'll kind of narrow things, funnel things down um, to more specific things that we find helpful in our own practice and managing our own mental health. So may I ask you first, how do you personally define health, wholeness, wellness, whatever, we even have so many words for this, right? Yeah, we do. Um, so yeah, it was um, something I was giving some thought to last night as we were getting prepared for this. And um, I think we tend to think of wholeness and health and wellness as the state of like, I'm in perfect health, right? I don't have any aches and pains. I don't have any chronic conditions. I don't have any mental concerns. I don't have, you know, any kind of illness. But for some of us, that's just not reality. And for some of us, that's never going to be reality. So my approach to wholeness and health and wellness has more, I think, to do with the coping and mm -hmm. the acceptance to realize like, yeah, I may have these conditions. I may not be happy about it. I can accept not being happy about it. Um, how do I cope with that? How do I um, deal with that in a way that allows me to continue to live my life in a way that brings me joy and peace, um, as well as accepting some of the more negative feelings I may have about my situation and um, not allowing those to consume me. Okay, so you touched upon, I think, a couple of important things. That acceptance and then distress tolerance. And hopefully we'll be able to circle back to distress tolerance when we, we talk more about the magical side of things. Because I think that's a real key in terms of the practice of natural magic. Okay, Kristen, how do you define wholeness or wellness? So, um, you know, we were talking about this last night and acceptance is the key word that's coming through for me. Um, when I think about um, like being truly authentic and content and comfortable with that, with who I am and where I am and um, sort of like having that honest structure to like stand on within myself, you know, and I'm thinking about uh, like desire and capacity back to awareness, like being aware of, you know, um, what's within my limits and um, how I can grow and, you know, like healthy coping mechanisms, like you were saying. Um, yeah, there's just so much, there's so much there. But it, I don't think any of the three of us, if I'm hearing you correctly, define wholeness or wellness or health as the absence of no. any kind of chronic condition or mm -hmm. the absence of anxiety, the absence of maybe some feelings of distress or feelings of um, depression. Like it's not the absence of those. It's like accepting those. Right. Wholeness is not perfection. Right. And there's no evidence, like in all of the history of humanity, that we could be perfect. Like it doesn't exist. I know Instagram might try to convince you otherwise, but the algorithm is a lie. And face, what is it called? Face, the face, face tuner, you know, the thing that they, all the celebrities use so they don't look human. Um, all these things aren't real. Those are things that are coming from like corporations mm -hmm. to kind of confuse us, to almost glamorize us in a, in a what I would say is an unhealthy use of glamour, right? They're convincing us that flawlessness is possible. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Right. Like you could, there's nobody who has a flawless life or who has a flawless body or who has a flawless mind. I think for those of us who are on like a spiritual path, this idea of like, sometimes it's called ascension. Do you know what I mean? That we're working up and becoming, or like in psychology, like Maslow's hierarchy or something like that we are moving towards something that transcends our human experience, mm -hmm. but we're human. So it's not that we're ever going to get there. Like, I think for me, having been around 
the witch world, the pagan world, the new age world for three decades, more than three decades now. That's one of the things that I've seen. And whenever I see it now, I think when I was younger, I was more susceptible to it. You know what I mean? Like thinking that well, there is this one thing I can do and all of my problems will um, vanish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th that's called wishful thinking, wishful thinking, coping, that you can just do this one thing and the depression will be gone. The anxiety will be gone. I think today maybe we'll land more in depression, anxiety, and stress or DAS, as it's sometimes called. Um, as opposed to like diagnostic conditions, because I think all of us have bouts of depression, anxiety, and stress, right? Like regardless of any other um, diagnoses we might have. Does that make sense if we kind of just hover around those three? Okay. So I don't know. I, I'm interested, May, what you think about how do we kind of balance when we have like this burning desire to just fucking feel better um, with that wise mind approach that I was just talking about. You know what I mean? That we know wishful thinking, like we know there is no insta magic for things really, like big things. I mean, it might help you find a parking spot, but you know, like when you're dealing with big complex things, like, how do you do that when you're so desperate? You just want to feel better. And then, oh, there's this someone selling me this thousand dollar course promising me I will feel better. Like, how do you do you? I don't know. Do you have any insight into this, this whole mess? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, something that Kristen was just saying about wholeness is not equal perfection made me start thinking about how the very definition of wholeness to me includes having negative and positive, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of these courses that do kind of sell this idea of like, like you said, ascension or rising above these like um, worldly issues or whatever that we have these physical, like transcending the physical, but the physical is part of who we are, right? And and the physical is so much of a part of our experience that I think to try to deny and overcome that would be really selling ourselves short. On the other hand, though, like I can see that when, you know, I've been in a position where all I wanted to do was to feel better. And I, you know, had I had the means, I probably would have spent those thousands of dollars to, on these courses to try to feel better. And so it's a very understandable thing, you know, when we're in the state of desperation to, um, just you know move on with our lives or to just feel like we can do something um and to escape the reality that we're in and um that is kind of like you said where the distress tolerance comes in is just learning how to um realize that maybe right now maybe someday but maybe not right now mm. you know um i can overcome this but right now i'm in it and so now what do I do, right? What what can I do? And sometimes for me, like that's as much, I mean, all I can do is meditate, right? Mm -hmm. All I can do is light a candle. All I can do is burn some herbs. All I can do is say a prayer. And um, that's not going to like radically change my reality immediately, but those small steps add up and those small practices add up. And those small little movements, you know, may feel frustrating and it's not going to cure me and it's not going to, you know, like, like waving a magic wand cure, but it, it, it is something that, I don't know, maybe this is part of my coping um, skills is that I used to be very much an avoidant and sometimes I can still be <laughs> avoidant, but there is something to be said for doing something. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like I could I could sit and worry. I mean, because my brain is going to want to worry anyway. And I can sit and ruminate and worry and stress and think what external thing can help me fix myself, right? Like this ten thousand dollar course. <laughs> or what can I do to empower myself to make my life a little bit more manageable or a little bit more acceptable or a little bit or feel a little bit better about the situation that I'm in. So you have a really great story that you kind of just live through in terms of 
like using magic to help you manage distress tolerance uh, in a situ in a work situation, which I think is such a great example mm -hmm. because we all work um, or have similar situations where there are where we're doing things and they are it's causing us stress and we're doing all the things that we should be doing in order to alleviate the stress of the situation. We're doing, you know, we're, we're approaching the situation. We're problem focused. We're organized. We have read atomic habits. You know, we, we've got our boundary, like we we're doing so many great things. And still, like you said, because so many of us have incredibly clever, active minds and they will go and they'll run amok. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just, you told you shared a great story about how you kind of gave your mind something to do um, that was yeah. magical, which I think is a great way of using magic to help with your mental health is like, just say, oh, mind, you want something to do? We're going to do this thing. That's magical. Right. Okay. So share yeah. us your story. Yeah. So um, I am, um, I am in the middle of getting a promotion right now. And um there was a little hiccup with technology um, with my background check. And so that caused me a lot of distress because I thought, what is going wrong? Is this a bad sign? My brain wanted to like work on these things. And so I did the proactive thing. I, you know, I messaged HR and I said, and I messaged the help desk and I said, you know, these are these things that are going on. I was starting my background check information and then it just disappeared. And I don't know what to do. You know, just let me know. And um so of course this happened before I left on vacation and my HR person was on vacation and um, my brain was just going a million miles an hour. Like this is a bad sign. This is not, you know, good. This is, you know, going to cause all these problems. And so I was at a pagan festival and there is a trusted vendor to me that was there and they had dressed candles. <laughs> and um, so I bought a dressed candle for success and victory. And I remember telling the vendor as I bought it, I said, you know, I've done all of the things I can do on this plane. And I figured if nothing else, if absolutely nothing else with this candle works, it will at least give my brain something to focus on. Like I will light the candle and I will tell my brain, okay, go to work manifesting that victory instead of worrying and ruminating about what can go wrong, focus on the victory. And I think like that, that focus is something that is so helpful for me in my spell work is like, if I can give my brain a job that is proactive and positive versus, you know, that self-sabotaging, worrying, stressful, you know, thing that it likes to do naturally. <laughs> It's like my brain is a German shepherd. It needs a job to do. <laughs> right. So, or like a border that, collie. That, and it just right, goes yeah. crazy. If you don't give it something to do. <laughs> so that is where spell work really comes in for me. And it just, and it also just helps me change my way of thinking about it. Like it starts to help me see the positive possibilities or the successful possibilities versus what can go wrong. I start thinking about what can go right. And then that just really boosts my mood too. That's such a great approach and I do the same thing like when things kind of fall apart I'll have that moment of like temporary closure mm -hmm. you know because I've trained myself don't react right away just sit like you said meditate just sit don't react right away unless you have to and like see my mind, my actions, my emotions as like energetic forces that are connected, just the way that spells are energetic forces, that all of these things about me are energetic forces. And how do I align myself to solving the problem? Because in my experience, when we do spells, and often rituals, it's because we need to solve a problem. And we're feeling some kind of distress. So already, you know, in talking about magic and mental health, it's already our motivation a lot of times is based in the fact that we are distressed. If everything was hunky-dory, we might not ever do 
magic or a ritual. Um, I, I would, because I just love it. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's interesting, like when we think about spell work, and this is something for me, I think where I'm at in my life right now, with I would say my own mental health is the best it's ever been in my life. You know, I have bouts of sadness, but I, I've really developed my distress tolerance muscles really intentionally over the past 10 years or so. And I teach magic. And one of the challenges for me as someone who teaches magic is that sometimes I'll feel like, well, I don't really even need to do this spell. I'm good. I've got plenty. Like I don't need an abundance spell. All is well here. Or um, I don't know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because part of me is in that mindset of spells are like therapy. You know, like, so you go to the therapist, usually when you're distressed. So you do magic when you are distressed. Mm -hmm. um, and also being in this different place in my life, I've really learned to find like the joy of magic. And when I'm not like freaking out, because I don't have my money for the mortgage or, you know, like you're trying to get a promotion at work and hail Mercury, the computer mm -hmm. system is not working. Um, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, so it's just, there is so much joy in spells, but also looking back to when I have been really at really low points in my life and use magic to get out of depression, to help me get out of depression, to deal with anxiety and, you know, just generalized distress that like it was so soothing to me irregard or regardless of like the magical outcomes because I am a firm believer that spells and rituals and so on talismans charms they do in subtle and often nuanced ways help to shift things within us and things outside of us But it's just the act of magic for me is therapy. Yeah, I can see that because I know for me, especially being such an animist, it's like those little, I think about all the little things that I do in my life that aren't necessarily like a set aside outside of my life kind of spell, but it's just something that like I stir things clockwise, almost always, right? You know, like I, just little things where my life is almost like the spell, my life is the magic and doing a spell, even like you said, like even when you're not desperate or you're not needing something right away, it's just a nice, like happy way to connect with something larger than yourself and to connect with that energy and to connect with that magic of life and to just experience the joy and magic of in life even if you are asking for something too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, right? so there's right. so much to um, like practicing magic and uh, being an animist. And I think that's really important for us to talk about too. Like all three of us are animist and really firmly connect to spirits of the natural world, um, ancestors, expressions of the divine. Like we, we see all of this as like our companions, mm -hmm. our helpmates, um, and not like as dictators. So it's, I think we have a very kind of like helpful, or, I, you know, I don't want to make us sound like, oh, we're so wonderful, but, but at the same time, like seeing these as helpers and spirits rather than vending machines that can kind of dole out favors at their will. You know, I will make jokes. Well, the gods clearly didn't want us to do that. But at the same time, I don't deep in my heart believe that, that the gods are to get me. Right. Yeah. I think it's like one reason why I usually say I work with X, Y, Z. You know, like I work with, I can say I work with, because while I see them as both greater than me and very imminent in the world it's like I also see them as they're like my companions right they're like my co-workers in this world you know like they're my 
you know, my co-activists, my co-creators, and, um, you know, I couldn't do any of the things that I do without them, I don't think, you know, without that feeling of support that I get um, from my helpful spirits and allies, but um, yeah, I definitely don't see it as a transactional relationship at all. Right, where we have to propitiate them, and if we don't propitiate them correctly in the way that they want to be propitiated, then they will get us. They will smite us down. Like I just fundamentally, I don't feel that in my bones in terms of my relationship with Hecate or Artemis or Cersei, Mede- you know, any of the the goddesses. And then also my beloved Mercury. I don't see them as being out to get me. Like I, I see them as being on my side. Right. Um, and at the same time, they are a way for me to move towards my own wholeness. Mm. You know, that connecting to Hecate through rituals, and I think we're trying to stay fairly focused on magic as opposed to rituals, because there is a distinction there. So we're trying to stay on the magical side of things. Maybe we'll do another episode and talk more about rituals and mental health. Um, But when I think of magic and connecting to what's greater than me, it's just a reminder of two things and this may sound paradoxical it reminds me that I am divine myself and also very small does that make sense Kristen yeah it makes total sense and you you're all saying everything that I'm thinking (laughs) like this connection (laughs) with the deeper world the spirits the deeper world is is like a support system but it's also reminds me that I'm part of this greater web and that like that divine current runs through me and there's for me there's a comfort like I feel less stressed out yeah when I am simultaneously reminded that I am a small, small part of that web wheel Mm -hmm. and that I'm also integral to it. Right. I'm not the whole wheel. Right. And it's to come back to, sorry, May, to come back to um, capacity, like May was saying, I mean, um, you have the power, like knowing that you, whatever you're going through, like you have that power to connect, whether it's a meditation, whether it's lighting a candle, whether it's like, you know, saying a prayer, like any, any little thing, like just knowing that you have that self-sovereignty, you know? Right. Like that I'm small and yet I am sovereign over my own life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so not an inflated, inflated sense of ego. Mm -hmm. Um, and seeing myself kind of as being in charge of my own life, living my own life, and not thinking, I don't know if I have the right words for this, but you know, it's like, when you, I at time, so this has been something I've struggled with in my life, is thinking that the whole world revolves around me. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to one of my favorite sayings is like, whatever is going on, like, is not me, and I am not it. And I, I, you also use that with other people. Mm-hmm. You know, so if I am having this big calamity in my life, then not only is it horrible for me, but it must be horrible, like the whole world must be on fire because of this thing happening to me. Instead of taking a step back, which for me, I found this to be really connected to my, um, you know, animistic perspective is seeing from a transpersonal perspective Mm -hmm. that all, you know, this horrible thing is happening to me. I'm going through divorce. I'm losing my house. I'm having a health crisis. My career has been flushed down the toilet. I'm effectively, you know, the universe has effectively kicked me to the curb of life with two kids you know it's like talk about depression um but also seeing that other people are having the same experience I'm not that special on any given day 
So I have a question. Did, okay. you know, this is bringing me into like this swirl of like thoughts and emotions and like when you are ruled by your emotions, right? Um, Cause that, that's, yeah, that's how I relate to situations like that. I think that I can get really, really overcome with my emotions or the stress or like whatever is going on in my life. Um, and uh, instead of like looking outward, right and sort of like seeing it from like a logical perspective or you know yeah I don't know I'll do this I call it like when I do when I see myself doing this you know starting to think that whatever is happening to me no one has ever had this health problem you know I I mean with my journey with the chronic pain conditions I have you know at time like I've been living like this my whole adult life so I mean at times I have been so absorbed in my own pain yeah. that that's all I can see and the emotions that go with that mm -hmm. but then like you said just to kind of see beyond your own nose and say you know there are suffering is part of the human condition like yeah. I haven't been singled out by Hecate like to suffer more than everybody else it's it's part of my journey uh, and the associated you know, feelings for me that go with it, like resentment, um, sadness, like a sense of loss and grieving for a lot of things I used to be able to do that I can't do. Mm -hmm. All of those emotions that we can kind of like cluster together under like the big banner of distress. It's mm -hmm. not quite clinical, but you know, it's really upsetting. So for me, getting back to doing spell work after, you know, trying to be normal, um, the act of doing spells just makes me feel better mm -hmm. like that that's all I, you know when people will ask me questions about being a witch I'll say it just like it just feels right to me and what I do feels right to me and I just applaud anybody who directs their energy towards what feels good to them in in a healthy way and is that it's so self-soothing for me right i just like it i just love being with you know what i mean look i just love yeah. being with the botanicals and the clay and whatever it is i mean we're in the coven together so whatever we're doing to me that's the equivalent of when we get together and do something in the coven like that, to me, I feel like we're going to a big music concert. Like we're going to see the Indigo Girls or something. Like it really brings me that level of joy. I don't know. Does that make sense, Kristen? Yeah. No, magic is medicine. Yeah. Um, and I, like, I kind of want to rewind to something. Um, you said something once before about, uh, and it's just really stuck with me, about tending to your own pain. And I've been thinking about how that can be applied to like, you know, whether it's physical pain or any kind of distress, um, tending to that as a teacher and a helpmate. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that when you're in that state and you're reaching for like some sort of healing, like that's the natural response, right? Is you reach for healing. And um, that's where magic really comes in for me as medicine. And then to bring it back to the whole um, capacity thing, like, you know, and doing what you're able and like just getting connected and like reaching out and, you know, I, do, am I making sense? Is that you're making perfect sense? And you know, what it reminds me of is, you know, in the coven, we have an expression, like we are the temple of good enough. We are good. We are enough. And to good enough magic. I think if you are, really distressed, stressed out, anxious, or, and maybe these things as they often are related to like chronic health conditions mm -hmm. that maybe are clinical diagnosis like PTSD or mm -hmm. autism or ADHD, fibromyalgia, you know, the whole thing, the whole panoply of chronic health conditions that can cause us to feel distressed in different ways because we have these conditions, like doing whatever it is you can. Like you can totally magic in your own mind. Like if you can't physically do it, mm -hmm. like the candle, like you said, May, like you went, you got the candle and it, you did the simple ritual, simple spell work. But also this idea of like, you can magic in your own mind and it gives the mind something to do other than yeah. ruminating. 
this this makes me think too of um sorry <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt but I was thinking about how you know when we're thinking about the overwhelm right of the emotion mm -hmm. okay so I'm from Oregon and we always have to be careful of the riptides that are at the coast you know in, in the Pacific Ocean that the sneaker waves that can come up and get you and then like so if you're caught in a sneaker wave you know the impulse is to try to swim out of it and fight against it and then you're just going to kind of get sucked in mm -hmm. so it's like most people will either try to fight against it or totally surrender to it and neither one of those is the right path and mm -hmm. so the the advice is to kind of go um, perpendicular to it right mm -hmm. so you're not surrendering you're not fighting but you're kind of taking a third unexpected path, I guess, you know, um, not, not either one of those is an obvious thing to do. Um, and so I think about, you know, like the lighting, the candle is something to pull me out of that riptide, right? Or to, you know, meditate that pulls me out of that riptide where I'm getting overwhelmed and I'm doing the barrel roll under the water of my emotions, right? Like just pausing, pushing that pause button and saying, okay, like, what can I do? I can breathe. Mm -hmm. I can work on my breath. Um, I can say a prayer. I can write. Um, that's to me like swimming perpendicular to the riptide. So I'm not getting sucked in. I'm not wasting my energy, getting overwhelmed and fighting against it and doing all of the big spell work, right? Like with the can, the fancy candles and the, you know, planetary hours and <laughs> the special herbs, right? I'm just doing what I can. I'm conserving my energy so that I can just get out of that riptide and then get back on solid ground with the support of my allies, you know, and the magic is kind of like, like when you were saying going to a concert, like I think about it, like if I'm doing solo magic, I'm thinking I'm not ever really solo, right? I'm calling in all of my friends. I'm calling in the flame. I'm calling in the botanicals. I'm calling in, you know, the, um, the energy of the waxing moon. Um, I'm calling in maybe Hecate or maybe I'm calling in Aphrodite or maybe I'm calling in Medea and these are my, you know, I'm calling my friends to help me. I'm mm -hmm. asking for support, right? And support seeking is like such a beneficial coping strategy. Like we, we talked earlier about how wishful thinking is a harmful coping strategy. And I think you might've mentioned that you tend to use avoidance coping. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, when we think about magic as a way of coping with our problems, talking about different coping strategies, kind of, it kind of gives us a container to say, it gives us a vocabulary to kind of go into what am I actually doing here? And I think part of like using magic to help with mental health is being at that crossroads where we're developing a vocabulary of words to describe our emotions. For example, like most of us don't really have a bunch of words to describe our emotions. So when you ask someone how they're doing, you know, they just say, well, I'm stressed out. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they, I don't know, it, like they are stressed out, but it, it, but it's often like, I'll use that term when I don't have the right word. And I will literally, like we work with, um, in the coven, like with the emotion wheel, it's like, well, what am I actually feeling? Am I overwhelmed? Am I exhausted? Am I worried? It's such a big one to say, oh, I'm worried about this thing. Am I sad? Um, do I feel insecure? Like all of these terms. And I firmly believe as a practitioner of magic that the more I understand these ideas better and know what's really going on inside of me and and have words because words are magic right and have words that accurately describe and feel right to me about what I'm feeling or you know what's going on in my head that that adds to the magic that I do so I can be really specific I'm feeling really sad I had about I would give myself I had a decent sized bout of sadness yesterday morning didn't I Kristen maybe teetering a little bit on the self-pity zone but I was <laughs> but I was feeling sad about something um and just to say like I'm feeling sad this is what's going on here I just need to talk about this thing uh, my mother recently passed 
and there's just a lot going on and you know and just thinking about having the ability to say I'm feeling sad that is my distress and it's okay like I can I can navigate feeling sad for a while and do the things like you said do like a light a candle Mm -hmm. um, and say you know sadness I've had enough of you you've taught me enough for today and now just go away it feels like a Sorry, like no, awareness or having the vocabulary to identify that, like exactly how you're feeling is um, like the stabilizer. I'm thinking to bring it back to the riptide, you know, when you're overwhelmed and you're just like swirling in the riptide. Um, I think that's probably the first key is like identifying exactly what's going on with you. Right. It, it's not always possible, right? Yeah. And sometimes the answer is, I have no fucking clue. Yeah. Right? So the it's magic you might do would thing. be, right? The magic would be revealed to me. For me, it would usually, it's usually Mercury. Mercury, mm-hmm. reveal to me, help me discover what is my problem. Right. So, well, the other thing I'm thinking about too is that when you don't have that sort of self awareness and you're flailing, like this is when you're going to reach for like unhealthy coping mechanisms. And I think where you can fall into that territory of like a wishcraft, right? Wish, wishcraft. Wish, I love that. You know, yeah. And you're just like trying to do all the things and like solve all the problems instead of like sitting with what's really happening and what you're capable of. I think and something can, you oh sorry that's something that you just said too Kristen makes me think too about how we are so um sometimes in such a hurry to get rid of those feelings yeah. right and sometimes like what you said is you just need to like have the strength to sit with them and then get to the point like where Cindy said you know like okay I've learned enough I've experienced what I need to feel and um you know, like, I don't want to get stuck here. So what can I do to move on? Mm-hmm. Well, back to what you said about wholeness, being embracing like the light and darkness, right? And I think about those like sadness and, um, you know, like overwhelm and all of those things are like spirits onto themselves. They're spirits that we need to know as well that can teach us that we need to work with, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's so important. I think to to discuss for a bit, like how we live in this society that values both keeping us highly anxious so we remain good consumers and at the same time tells us we should only be happy. So we have this dual messaging if you engage in popular culture much. And I try not to because it it bothers me like it's not good for my mental health part of my magic is the off button and not you know doing watching too much news or things that upset me but I'm thinking about this so we have this whole culture the algorithm now especially with the internet that's pushing products and things at us and it knows it's driven by people who have designed it to induce greater states of anxiety. And at the same time, if we look at a lot of mainstream cultural images, like I'm, I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about what I put out on social media, not the, not this pod, but the, the social, like Facebook and Instagram. And you know how there's this thing that everybody on social media is happy. Right except for the few brave souls who are talking about hard things. But even then, a lot of times I swear, you know, they do their hair and makeup and they look fantastic, which there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes I just want to see people being a hundred percent authentic. Like the way, you know, if we were together, like flesh, you know, that fleshiness of togetherness Mm -hmm. that you miss, Mm -hmm. um, with all the wonders of being online, it's bringing us all together. But, you know, that fleshiness that, oh, you farted or, you know, your hair is doing something weird today that when we're online, like you don't see mm-hmm. all of that kind of humanity and it creates this weird facade, I think, that's linked to this fixation on happiness. 
I mean, I really apply. I know there's a lot of voices about mental health speaking out now, and I'm really so thrilled in my heart is just loves it that people are talking about these kind of things the way we are. But I'd still kind of feel that there is this big push that advertisers and the algorithms want to keep us anxious. Big Pharma wants to keep us on anxiety medication, which is sometimes necessary. And then also social media is kind of like the magazines I used to look at when I was a teenager, like Seventeen Magazine, we're just all so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And if we're not wonderful, you know, here's like seven steps that you can get the guy at your dreams. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That was a bit of a ramble. No, it's back to chasing perfection. Oh yeah, that's right. Chasing perfection. Flaw flawlessness. Yeah. Or the waving the wand and having a perfect life. You know, that's just not how magic works in my experience. <laughs> you know, it's it's subtle, subtle, small changes that add up. Right. So do subtle, small things that have meaning for you and are part of solving a problem um resist i would say resist anything that doesn't connect to your creativity because once we kind of unlock however creativity works in us like some of us are really great at planning things and our creativity comes up that way and some of us are painters and some of us are imaginers you know we can imagine whole stories in our head so whatever creativity is for you like just I think magic and creativity go hand in hand and we know like there's so much research that shows that creativity is so healing for depression anxiety and stress loneliness oh I, I wanted to talk about that because you landed on something really good May about saying like when you are doing magic and you feel connected to your spirits. And so a huge part of mental health that really, this will really pull us under, you know, it's like, there's that riptide. I think the riptide is feeling isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, given that like depression, anxiety, distress, these are parts of life, but it's when the riptide is like isolation, when we feel isolated and cut off. Mm -hmm. So I would really appreciate if you could say more about how you feel connected and not isolated when you do magic yeah so um you know it's really just that feeling of tapping in like you said to something bigger than yourself right and not only that but you know again as an animist I feel like so many things have their own individual spirits and their own individual magic and so when I gather those things around me and I start you know engaging with them you know it's almost like I am talking to my friends it's also it's almost like I'm in my little support group right or I'm reaching out or you know I mean as a person who's experienced significant mental illness you hit the nail on the head that loneliness is so huge and I think that's one reason why you know getting into treatment that wasn't just individual therapy for me was such a, an important part of my healing and the work that we do in the coven is such an important part of my healing because um, I do feel like I'm not alone. But even if I can't reach out to other people, I remember, oh, yeah, I have these allies, these spiritual mm -hmm. allies that I can reach out to. And that does bring me comfort because not only does it make me feel and, and I really do. I mean, I feel it in my body. Right. I feel their presence. I feel that I'm not alone, um, which is so huge. I mean, it's a real feeling, you know, to feel that comfort of, it's almost like, oh, here is, you know, my foxglove essence that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, uh, it reminds me of happy days in childhood. And, and I have that feeling associated with it. And it has its own spirit. And it's almost like being wrapped in a warm hug, you know, or I like the flame and I can feel the warmth echoing within me, you know, that with that flame, I can feel it, the warmth spreading from my heart you know, in a, in kind of a, a symbiosis, right, between the flame and my, my own body, and just, we live in such a lonely, lonely culture, I mean, even with all the connectivity that we have in social media, it's not, it's not the nourishing kind, it's not, 
I mean, we have, I mean, I met my partner through social media. So, I mean, it's not that we can't make those connections, but it's a superficial connection when you're in that social media, right? It's not the same as being in a community with somebody or being, um, you know, having these meaningful, uh, authentic conversations with people. And so magic is one way when I don't have access to other humans that I can find that energy to connect with something bigger than myself and to know that I'm not alone and to know that I have support and um, I can just be real. I can just be myself. I don't have to pretend to be capable or to, to pretend to know the answers or, you know, I mean, there've been times when I feel like, wow, people really think I have my shit together and I absolutely do not. <laughs> you know, And so uh, you know, just that feeling of like, okay, well, here is something that I can do to feel more empowered and to feel more, um, I don't know, just kind of surrounded in love, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. And the authenticity. I mean, Kristen said it a bunch of times. I mean, that's just such a huge part. And, you know, you've said it too, Dr. Cynthia, that you're just knowing that we're not alone, that we're not the only people going through this shit, right? To know mm. that we're not I'm not the only person that has ever like gotten a divorce and lost my job and had problems paying the water bill, you know, and needing to rely on charity for that or this or that, you know, where when you're in it, you can feel such shame about those things, or you can feel like the universe is out to get me or the gods are out to get me. And that can be a really difficult feeling. And so to know that, you know, okay, well, what am I going to do? I mean, I can sit here and worry and stress and dwell on the fact that I can't pay my water bill and I better start saving up jugs while I can <laughs> so I can flush my toilet, et cetera, <laughs> you know, right? Or, you know, like I can, you know, I can just sit and stress about it or, you know, I can do the reset. I can do my magic. The magic can remind me that I'm not alone. I can remember, oh yeah, I can reach out to these organizations that help people with this or, you know, okay, well, I've had my pity. And now, like you said, I've had my self pity. And, and now it's time to take action. I don't know, there's just something about doing the magic that just kind of helps me get over that hump of, I can't ignore this dwelling on it isn't helping. What's my next step, right? It can give us some momentum. Yes. However small or great, you know, that momentum to do one thing. Yeah. You know, to be like you said, reach out to organizations if you're having financial difficulties. And it, you know, I think magic gives us a sense of agency too, that I can do this spell. So if I can do this spell, maybe I can make that phone call too. Right. And maybe my magic will help me make that phone call. And that phone call could lead me to like group therapy that would be beneficial to me. It may not be, but magic I think helps us to be more comfortable with distress. And also when we feel like that, we're supported by humans or animal or pets or our deeper world spirits, then it kind of gives us that secure base that we talk about in attachment all the time. So I can take a little risk because I know I have something that's real and true and meaningful and supportive to me to go back to if, if it all falls apart. Like if the group therapy is horrible and they're mean to me there or whatever, like I know I have something to come back to. Mm -hmm. um, that's special to me, that it's that it doesn't need to be something that everyone in my group um, session knows about. I don't need to be with, you know, like a witchcraft therapy, a witchcraft DBT group th therapy, we can be all different people. Um, and this can be something like that's unique to me that I don't necessarily need to disclose to a therapist or a he other healthcare provider. Um, it's not their business. Like you don't disclose everything to a healthcare provider. So, because I think that comes up and I know I've like, I've answered or tried to answer questions about this before. Like, how do you talk to your therapist? about your practice of witchcraft? How do you talk to your therapist about Hecate? And, you know, I did that episode a couple of years ago on being the witch in the room. And I, 
I do think I hit on some decent points in that. So I would recommend that people kind of look back and watch that one or listen to that one if they haven't. Because like we don't owe people anything. We don't owe people. This is magical to me. I don't owe people my magic. I don't owe people like being happy. Like I'm not obligated to alter my state of being to please other people. Like, does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if my thread was clear at all. I was just kind of going with it. Like in terms of practicing magic, I do it because I believe, and I know I've seen the results that it does that thing. Like you said, May, like it gives us oomph. Mm-hmm. It gets us over that hump. I love saying that, like that we're kind of stuck in the muck. Mm-hmm. And it's like magic is when you find that foothold, right? You're in the muck, you can't get out of the muck. And all of a sudden there's terra firma under one foot and you can get one foot out of the mud. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like the riptide, you find that way to transact the, the riptide. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily that it's over instantly. Like, Jesus doesn't come down out of the sky and pluck you out of the riptide. <laughs> Though that would be kind of cool. Um, I, I guess I'm just thinking of like the whole Jesus walking on water business. Do you know that? Do y'all know that story? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> your riptide and your riptide analogy got me going with like, well, what if like the whole idea of wishful thinking and the wishful thinking would be like Jesus or Hecate or the angels or somebody. <laughs> you know, we just show up when you're stuck in the riptide and yank you out. Yeah. Um, and and the I Lord think of the Rings eagles flying down. Oh yeah, the that's eagles. Right. yeah. <laughs> Which could happen. Um, but more, but often that's really dipping more into fantasy uh, it, than seeing them as helpmates that might give you some guidance on how you can transact the riptide yourself and you know like this they help you find terra firma it's like put your foot there swim that way mm-hmm. rather than ta-da jesus on the water shows up right i could have used some jesus on the water a few times in my life or hecate on the water i don't know if y'all do, can y'all relate mm-hmm. All right. So we go ahead. Sorry. Just one last thought is that I think too, um, sometimes magic can help me see my options. You know, when you're in that overwhelm, that emotional overwhelm, you can't really see your options Mm -hmm. clearly. And the calm that magic brings me can help me clear my mind enough to see that I do have options and then move forward from there. Yeah. That's a real benefit of magic is that clarity of mind, acceptance of you know what's going on it just brings things energetically psychologically like it can give you that space where you can actually like take a beat see take the see what's going on Mm -hmm. see what you can do so i mean it can be so helpful practicing magic and again we're talking about our form of natural magic that's very animistic Mm -hmm. um to it can really really help you with your mental health So we did something super special today. We have an audience for this recording for the first time ever. Um, So thank you to everybody who's here in our audience. So we're going to open up Hecate's mental health help desk to see if anybody has comments or questions just for the next few minutes. Oh, hello. So for me, magic has always been um, super, it was really attractive to me when I was younger and I felt like I was very powerless in uh, my home situation. And it's something that I've wrestled on and off with. Like I've heard Cindy say she's broken up with things several times and given away all of her stuff. But, you know, it always resurfaces for me when I feel powerless or I feel like I don't have a voice. And um, 
listening to you guys, like May, your last point about how uh, doing the magic helps you to realize that you have options because we get in such a state of overwhelm that we sometimes are blinded by that and cannot see that we have other options or avenues to explore. And um, I just think this was such a wonderful conversation you ladies all had today. And oh. that's all I have to share. <laughs> oh, thank you. I think that's such a good point. Um, the doing, you know, re coming back to magic when the shit hits the fan. Yeah. Which I think is fine. Um, and then it's, you know, it's, it's like a daily practice. You know, if the only time you do magic is when the shit hits the fan, it can work. It can be fine and super helpful. But if you do something every day to attune to whatever spirits that you connect with, then it's like you're building a relationship mm -hmm. and it's like you're, you're, it becomes a preventative measure. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we go into therapy only when things fall apart. And then there's also for those who have the luxury of being able to afford it, continuing to go to therapy so you don't ever get in the situation where things fall apart again even when life gets really horrible you're developing like a set of tools for coping with it and I think that's where staying in your magic even when times are good can be beneficial and it can be like an insurance policy mm -hmm. um, for when bad things happen that you're not going to mm -hmm. completely come unglued does that make sense? Yeah. Two things that um, you said too um, is that there is something to be said for magic giving you that sense of like, maybe I can't control the situation. Again, kind of going back to my promotion story, right? Like I can't control what technology does, but I can control what I do with my energy. Um, and then to speak to Dr. Cindy is what she said um, about a daily practice, right? It, it also makes me think of like the skills that we can learn in therapy, different kinds of therapeutic skills like DBT skills come to mind or any kind of distress tolerance skills. The time to learn and practice those is not when you're in distress. It's when you're calm and you can like get it in your head, get it into your brain, get it into your bones. And then it becomes much more easy to use them when you are in distress because you don't have to go, oh, what was the acronym again? What are the steps? What do I do? Because you've practiced it like a fire drill, right? You know, you have the groove in your brain that that well-worn path of like, I know how this works and I know how, yeah, mind memory, muscle memory, um, how this is going to go. And it just makes it that much more powerful when when the shit does hit the thing. Oh, well, that's so great. We just have some comments in the chat about learning to do this, like learning to do your daily practice, learning to um, work with your coping strategies all the time. So they do become really ingrained and energetically speaking, like there's a magic to that, right? Mm -hmm. To routine uh, and forming those connections. Like, so your brain is knows the way to do these things. So when things do get rough, it becomes like an automatic response. Okay, Kristen, you got any final words for us? Um, <laughs> <laughs> two, two thoughts, two thoughts went completely out of the blue. I've been sitting with this thought and magic is medicine. And when you started talking about like um, a daily practice is maintenance, I instantly thought like a multivitamin. Like I'm, yes, I'm I love like, that, a multivitamin. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> and then also you know this whole idea that um energy goes where attention flows is one of our favorite things to say and so like keeping that conduit open you know um yeah. it's so true that i think that's a great point to end on right energy flows where attention goes so if you are stressed anxious depressed about many things rightfully so if you live in this world today and your mind is clever and busy and wants to hover and circle and camp out um, on things that cause you a lot of upset, like 
magic can be a way out of that to give your mind something to do. It helps you to gain, gain some clarity, a sense of agency. And there's also the actual like energetic aspects of magic that you're doing something that is working on a deeper or greater level than you that will help you get on the right road. So we've circled all the way back to where we started with this um, spirit of Anodia, you know, the journey for the goddess. So I hope um, our conversation has been helpful along your journey and that you find ways to practice your own type of magic that really um, is healing to you. So, so thanks so much for joining us for this conversation. And we'll be back with more in the coming weeks. The Keeping Her Keys podcast is produced and hosted by me, Cindy Brannon. I'm a witch and psychologist living in coastal Nova Scotia, Canada. I've written several books about Hecate and also my very first book that's more of an introduction to Awakening the Witch Within. That one's called True Magic. My frequent guests on the show are guides from my school known as Covina, the Coven of Hecate. You'll be listening to them on different episodes, and they are just an amazing group of witches that I am so happy to have in the circle of making this podcast a reality. Episodes usually explore something connected to the goddess Hecate. I became fascinated with the goddess Hecate so, so long ago. I do deep dives with different partners on goddesses and aspects of Hecate. Sometimes I do more psycho-spiritual episodes where I talk about constructs and how they intersect with the practice of natural magic. And frequently, you'll find meditations. If you're interested in learning more about my work, just go to keepingyourkeys.com. You'll find out more about my books, more about Hecate, and how you can join Covina, the Coven of Hecate. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to follow it. I usually new release new episodes every Thursday. And I would absolutely love it if you could rate and review the podcast. It is so, so helpful. If you have any questions, or ideas for future shows, you can send them to info at keepingherkeys.com. Thanks so much for listening, and hail Hecate.